Hello, this is the voice of Stuart Pierce, and welcome to my series of Deep Dialogues. These are vital conversations I engage in with global soul stewards from all over the planet, providing us with vital understandings about how we can create a new hierarchy of values to help us evolve into a brave new world. I hope you enjoy, and thanks for listening. And watching. <laughs> Greetings, beacons of light. Julie, hello. And we have uh, the most amazing gentleman sitting here, Dimitri. Hello, Julie. Hello, Marianne. Dimitri is an extraordinary gentleman. Let me introduce you to him. Dimitri is the co-founder and co-spiritual director of the Spiritual Arts Institute, functioning as a metaphysical teacher, as a healer, and as co-author with his great colleague, Barbara Y. Martin, producing books and programs such as the international bestseller, Change Your Aura, Change Your Life, Communing with the Divine, Karma and Reincarnation, The Healing Power of Your Aura, and his newest book, or their newest book, Heaven and Your Spiritual Evolution, which this particular dialogue is dedicated to. So their books have received awards, including the Nautilus Book Award and the Benjamin Franklin Book Award. Whoa, well done. And so Dimitri speaks regularly on a wide variety of spiritual topics, appearing on numerous radio shows, podcasts, and TV. And at the end, we will make sure that Dimitri's um, website address will be placed on the screen for everybody and of course it will be associated with the recording. Dimitri, you dear man, thank you so much for joining me. Well thank you so much for having me on for this dialogue and we've been, I've been looking forward to it. Bless you, bless yeah. you and I'm intrigued to hear about this wonderful book, your latest book. Uh, I mean you have been propagating wonderful teachings for so many years. Right. Right. So, well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we are with a very mature um, healer. I don't mean that <laughs> in years. I mean in terms of experience and yeah. expertise. So tell, tell us about how you conceived your latter book. Right. Well, um, yeah, like you say, it, you know, Barbara has been one of the pioneers in metaphysics. She started talking. She was well known, especially for the aura uh, initially, although she's a metaphysical teacher and she was doing it long before it was a popular thing. So the book is, first of all, based on 50 years of clairvoyant study and experience. I've been working with her, I, I guess, like you said, I'm a mature man now, almost 38 years. So this is, um, you know, all of you probably know, metaphysics is really a way of life. It's not like you, oh, I'm just going to take a class or this is a hobby of mine. You know, this I, I started in the film industry myself mm -hmm. and I was having these experiences I couldn't put my finger on uh I just would call them my inspiration moments and then it led to my own very profound spiritual awakening which I called sort of my Saul in the road to Damascus moment mm -hmm. and um shortly after then I got when I realized what it was even then I didn't understand what it was initially but when I realized it was metaphysics then I couldn't get enough of it and about a year later I met Barbara at a dinner party and she did a meditation, which was the first time I ever meditated. And I, by the end of that night, I said, I found my teacher, you know. Um, and I didn't realize eventually she was going to train me to teach and mm -hmm. sort of carry the torch. She's a, a generate. She's part of the greatest generation, you know. Um, and although she's retired from active, active teaching, we're still doing all, still doing all this writing. Mm -hmm. And I like to tell people the first book, The Change or Change of Life, tells mm -hmm. the world what we do we we meditate with divine light this book tells the world who we are mm -hmm. spiritual growth our, our whole organization all of our work everything we're doing is about growth and unfoldment and this is sort of like the cosmology of that if we were to ask you know 20 people what is spiritual growth i bet we would get 20 different answers uh we understand okay it's it's something maturing we know a little seedling grows into maybe a whole oak tree or a little child grows to an adult but what does it mean for the actual soul to grow 
And how do you even begin to measure that? Like you might measure, oh, you're in 10th grade or 11th grade or 12th, or I'm 15 years old, I'm 16. How do you even begin to gauge that? So the book attempts to answer that. So in, in some ways I would say, and I speak on behalf of Barbara, it's probably her masterpiece in the sense of painting the big picture of metaphysics. Why are you even studying it? One of the challenges we had there is it's so much there. It's sort of like Blavatsky's secret doctrine. How do you even begin to, encapsulated and because you kept you know okay the aura you're just focusing on the aura but with this you have to pull in the aura you have to pull in the spiritual hierarchy you have to pull in reincarnate you have to pull in many the other side you know one of the things this book does is it really does attempt to describe what the other side is like from you know all the experiences that barbara's had and you know i've, I've had experiences on the other side so to know their they're real places and they're not just for when we die you know they're helping us right now and this is why we put the two together heaven spiritual evolution is the mm -hmm. two are interlinked mm -hmm. your evolution is directly connected to heaven and the journey of heaven and when mm -hmm. we were almost going to call the book you don't go to heaven you grow to heaven mm -hmm. it ended up being the first chapter title but that's really the theme heaven is an evolutionary process we're all engaged in it right now and i'm sure everyone listening here has already had some type of spiritual awakening mm. and what we tell people you know that's not accidental that's that's god knocking on your door mm. so please, as you are you know really answer the call and if anything make it a bigger part of your life because we really are as you're saying in your introduction you know we are really are an inflection point as a civilization where we can make some leaps and bounds spiritually mm -hmm. for the higher share there's never been a better time to grow spiritually than today despite mm -hmm. the challenges of the world despite the dramas of the world there's more opportunity more power more understanding coming in now uh, mm -hmm. let's face it it wasn't that long ago if you and i were going to have a conversation like this we'd mm -hmm. be in a mystery school or an ashram we wouldn't be mm -hmm. doing this on a public platform mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. that's telling you what's happening. <laughs> so you speak in very beautiful, broad brushstrokes about the um, the entire longevity of your own revolution of consciousness and the development and the evolution thereof of your soul's practice and the right. and the 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 efficacy of it, the way that it's expanded and brought you even more mysteries and even more miracles and even more magic. Yeah. Could you give us perhaps three things that you feel have become the jewels of what you have acquired in your developmental practice over the last 40 years? Oh, wow. I've never had that question. <laughs> <laughs> Can you wrap up 40 years of work? Um, I will say a couple of things, and I'm just sort of streaming here, you know. Um, when I had my awakening, I got, I was incredibly excited and I'm more excited today. So how many things in life after you've done them for almost 40 years, are you finding it more fulfilling, more exciting, more, I can't wait to take the next step. Mm -hmm. So in a way you could say it's a little bit like art, right? Because if you're an artist, you're hopefully, they say, oh, what's your best movie? Oh, my next one. You know, you're, you're always thinking, no, this is, I did this today, but uh, it, it's what's coming next. I don't want to ever feel stilted or I, mm. I'm done or, you know, no, it's it's an eternal, it's an, it's, it's an evolutionary process. So I would say that is one of the very first things. Um, the sense of, uh, I will say this road wasn't easy. If you're looking for a road of lilacs and roses, this might not be that road <laughs> you know, as far as ease of the road. So what it's helped me do is overcome challenges that have inevitably been part of the journey to feel more personally empowered, more uh, personally in control of my life, not in control necessarily of everything going on around me. I'm, you know that we can't control everything going on around us, but we can control how we're handling it. Um, and the mystical insights, the, the, the ability that, you know, yes, there is this veil of matter between I mean, there's a veil between the physical and the spiritual. And as you dive into this, that, that veil starts to, mm. you know, slowly dissolve. And you start to have a more 
direct rapport with that which may appear invisible, let's put it that way, but really isn't. And that also makes you feel, you know, this side, the other side, it's, it really is part of the same life. Mm. So you lose a little bit your worry about, you know, things like death or, gosh, am I going to get all done in this life? Or, you know, you, you start to realize there's just such a bigger picture here. Now, I will share one of the foundations that I've been using all these years is meditation. And if anyone is not yet really making meditation part of their life, that really has to be the cornerstone because if you don't take that time to kind of pull back from everything and just get inside of your inner spiritual you, there's no way you're going to communicate with the divine. There's no way you're going to get in, in touch with that in a, in a systematic way. And I would say the last one is service. I had no idea I was going to be part of, I mean, when I started with Barbara, we were always doing things for others from day one, right? It was never just, oh, I'm just studying for myself. But the idea that I may be able to shepherd some of this to other people, mm -hmm. it goes beyond words. You know, it goes beyond words, the honor to do that and to help someone else in their journey. And so that has been a surprise that was not what I was thinking initially. Mm -hmm. But when it started to happen, I realized, oh, actually, I do have a knack for this. I don't generally have photographic memory, but when it comes to this work, I can remember things that happened 40 years ago, you know, in detail with, with dialogue and all of that. So you realize some things, you know, kind of hit you so deep, it just becomes, you know, a part of you. So mm -hmm. I would say those are some of the, and one other thing is the beauty of how the the whole world has, when, when I started this was very fringy stuff, you know, in terms of society, you know, there was nobody doing yoga regularly or things that, you know, and now to see these years later, wow, the world has, maybe it's not fully caught up yet, but it's much more out there. And, you know, 40 years ago, Barbara was saying, we're at the beginning of a Renaissance. This is just the clarion call, you know, and now to start seeing that clarion call kind of mature, that's been extraordinarily rewarding. Yeah, just yeah. to feel like you're part of it, however small you are. Yeah. I agree. And, you know, 40 years ago, it was rather like the lone voice in the desert preparing yeah. for the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and now we look at the extraordinary evolution. Right. So thank, thank you for that. It gives, um, it, it, it um, solidifies or substantiates the wonder of what you're actually sharing with us. Um, as you've gone through this evolutionary process, as you've also witnessed it in others, and the wonderful bounty and the beauty of what you've shared with so many people globally, um, which has improved their lot, as well as uh, expanding your own creative horizons, what, what, what do you feel is the, the major principle that the divine is asking of us at this time in our evolution? Ooh to fulfill our spiritual potential. What does that mean? It means all of us come into this world, you know, there's a journey to the divine, right? There's a journey to heaven. So we're saying heaven isn't just a one-shot deal. We, we evolve there through many, many, many lifetimes. So all of us right now are somewhere along in that journey. Now, there is what's called, you know, Max Heidel gave a great description of the journey. He said there's sort of like two paths. There's this gentle, slow, spiraling path that all humanity is on. And then there's sort of the straight and narrow, the path of the initiate. It's much steeper, but it's also much quicker. So, again, if you've had the spiritual calling, everybody's evolving, whether they even use that title or not. But if you now know you're evolving then you're supposed to sort of take this more accelerated path. This is the time to put much more direct energy into it. And let's say, okay, I'm at this point in my evolutionary path right now. Ultimately, I will get here. But in this lifetime, I could make it to here. I could go from here to here. I could make this major evolutionary jump. And they're saying this is the time to do that. More than ever, this is the time to not sit on the fence and really put your hands to the plow and really get into this because you can really make this happen. And I like to call it the triple blessing because if you reach your potential, not only have you blessed this life, 
you're blessed when you cross over to the other side and you're blessed when you come back in your another lap on earth so you have you have triple blessed your life by doing this um oh you know what i see lisa's asking a question is he talking about barbara marx hubbard no we're speaking of barbara y martin the the co-writers barbara martin barbara y martin thank you for asking that that's a notice you came late lisa <laughs> <laughs> To worry, yes. Uh, Bar Barbara Marx Hubbard, late lamented, was a very, very dear friend of mine. Oh. Um, however, yes, so thank you for reminding us about Barbara Marx Hubbard. No, this is another Barbara um, who, who um, uh, Demetri has been working with for many, many years, as you said. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for giving us that wonderful illustration of what you see evolution about. Of course, we are divine beings. So I, right. although I take your point that we grow into divinity, the point is that we are really just attempting to remember who we truly are rather than what we have become. And so would you say that the evolutionary path is very much about seeing the markers that have brought about a certain way of being, a certain way of thinking, a certain way of um, interpreting what the world is all about in 3D and how many of those symptoms or paradigms or syndromes are actually quite misleading. <laughs> it's part of the world of illusion rather than what we are now beginning to gather as spiritual beings having a human experience. Right, right. I love what you said about um, the nature of the fact that this is not a hobby. This is a devotional, we didn't actually use that word, but my no, word is it's, very a devotional, much devotional. it's a devotional path. And it requires veneration and discipline uh, and dedication. That's really what I feel you're saying. Absolutely. The devotional path that, you, um, that you've been on evidently informs the whole of your being because we can feel it radiating from you as you speak. There is a wonderful bubbling joy within you. So although you referred to the path as being a difficult one, a lot of <laughs> bed of roses, the point is that it seems you're pretty happy. Oh, no, I'm, I'm happy with my life. I'm just saying if, if people expect things to be easy, I didn't acquire this easily. You know, you did have to work at it. Um, there was a great um, healer in the United States years ago. His name was um, Joel Goldsmith. Uh, there's a great book he wrote, The Art of Spiritual Healing. And one of his, one of his not more than philosophy, one of his principles was, I get into a state of consciousness where illness doesn't exist. And when I get there, the person I'm working with generally feels some relief. But he also said a little bit later, it took me 13 years to develop that. In other words, he didn't just one day say, I'm in a state of consciousness where illness doesn't, you know, he had to, actually had to, to, to build that. But I appreciate you saying that because it is a joyful road. And, you know, another thing I think everybody hopefully is keeping in mind is, you know, every step of this path is paved in love. Mm -hmm. You cannot climb the spiritual ladder unless you're unfolding your own love expression, your compassion, your understanding. If you say, oh, I could take or leave my fellow humans, but, oh, I love God. No, that's, mm -hmm. that's not true, you know. Mm -hmm. But you said something else, Stuart, that that was, again, going into the deep end of the of the pool here, um, that, you know, we're, there is a, from our human awareness, there are certain conundrums that almost, you have to almost accept because our human intellect will only be able to contain so much at one time. And it's sort of this idea that on the one hand, we are as divine as we're ever going to be. We are this eternal spark of life and that spark is divine and that spark is good. But we're also in a process of becoming, shall we say, more splendid or more aware of that divinity, like you're saying. So it's what we call the being and the becoming. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, our whole evolution is an evolution in consciousness. Since we all have this inherent spirit of life, which is inherently good, doesn't matter what you're doing, right or wrong, that, that spark of life remains pure and good, but you, we may not be expressing it. And we may not be fully bringing it out. And that's what we call like a young soul is just learning that. So in our teachings, we say the difference between the life that is in an amoeba and the life that is in an archangel, it's essentially the same eternal life. 
but the expression is far different because the archangel has developed far more conscious awareness of that divinity and that gives that archangel far more ability to express itself but eventually the amoeba will get to that archangelic state now that may be a long time by duration standards but it will happen so yes everyone should feel their sense of worth their sense of internal value i don't mean the the veil i don't mean the the persona i don't mean the mirror mirror on the wall who's the fairest one of all i, I don't i don't mean that but the the life that is in you is priceless mm -hmm. the only ones have shared something i've always remembered if one soul were missing creation would not be complete mm -hmm. that's how important mm -hmm. we are beautiful yeah. and of course much of the perception that you provide for us which is really beautiful because you sort out the conundrum you sort out the puzzle <laughs> and that so much of what you speak of is about the passing of time that the substance of evolution gives a suggestion that we start off as being poorly and weakly or at least immature and unformed and we grow through time into a level of maturity but of course that's only experienced here because of living weight, space, and time. And soon as we move into the higher octaves, which we call heaven or the source, time ceases to be. And therefore we have greater access to the divine mind. Um, do you, 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 much of your teachings earlier on, and I'm sure still are, are the beautiful and extraordinary awakening consciousness of mm -hmm. interpreting aura, of teaching aura, and of expanding consciousness mm -hmm. through aura, processes right. which i'm assuming originally came from your fascination with light well yes and also again barbara is one of the few people that sees the aura with such in depth you know when we when the aura book came out which was 20 years ago uh you know people were thinking oh i'm a blue aura and you're a green aura and she's a pink aura you know it was a very almost cartoony image of yeah. what Aura was and to realize an aura is more intricate than your physical body <laughs> was kind of a milestone there but remember everything every, right now everything we're expressing <clears throat> everything we're thinking feeling it's rating an aura right now corresponding to the quality of what we're we're thinking or feeling if i say no i feel fine you know my words are saying that but i'm feeling miserable you know my aura is going to show <laughs> the, the, the latter, not the former. Um, but in terms of tying back to evolution, the aura is the fuel of our evolution. We want to build up more spiritual power because that's what's helping us ascend through dimensions of life. So Barbara would teach, you know, the most precious thing you possess is your aura, is your light. I mean, the light that's in your aura. It is your passport to eternity. We're not going to, take our fame, our fortune, you know, to the other side, but we are going to take our light. So whatever you do, earn light, build up that part of you. We talk about leave this world better than the way we found it. Yes, we definitely want to do that, but we also want to leave this earth at a higher level of consciousness than when we started it. Hmm. So that meant we had built up our auric field and that's the fuel there. And this brings up one really crucial thing to share. And again, I know is, you know, people, when they think of the other side, again, they may have a simplistic picture over there, not realizing the other side isn't one place. It's many, many realms. As the Bible says in my father's house are many mansions. And those are actual places you can actually visit and experience and see and interact with. And they're also levels of consciousness. So here, for example, in physical life, it's kind of a melting pot, right? You could have a high vibration of a Mahatma Gandhi. And physically, he could be standing next to a lowly vibration of a, you know, an Adolf Hitler. They could physically be in the same room together. Although it probably wouldn't be a pleasant experience for either one of them. But they could do it. Not so much on the other side. On the other side, you're going to find that you're going to gravitate to a level of consciousness based on how much power you've earned. So let's say right now, we're all here on this earth, even this moment, vibrating to a spirit, to our aura is vibrating at a level corresponding to a level on the other side. 
So if today were my day to go home, to transition home, I would transition to that place I've earned the right to be at. It's not reward or punishment. It's like attracting like. If I've earned 100,000 watts of power, that's where I'm going. But if I've earned 50,000, I'm not going to the place where it's 100,000. I'm going to the place where it's 50,000. So we're so integrated with that inner world right now. And that's why you said, well, what's what's the, what are they urging us? They're urging us now is a growth period time. Now is a grow a soul growth, like a sprouting time. We we can, you know, it's like a, we talk about quantum leaps. You know, this is a time where we can make a seismic jump individually. And yes, humanity as a whole is on this upward trajectory at the moment to try to lift it to its next, its next plateau. So it's happening individually. And it's happening collectively. Hmm. It's difficult, isn't it? Because speaking in space terms and speaking in domain or realm terms is something that helps us, it, as you know, within weight, space, and time, to locate where our consciousness can be placed. But of course, there is another level of consciousness beyond 3D where there is no realm, there is no domain, it just is. And therefore the vibration and the, the tonal frequencies are the acute thing, which is, I guess, what you're tuning into when you speak of the light as fuel or aura as fuel. If aura is fuel, what is the dynamo in human terms? The dynamo meaning the spur that pricks the yeah, side of your head. You put fuel into your car, and right. your car has a motor. So what's the right. motor? What's the dynamo? I'm well, just the motor, the mo the, uh, the motor is our own motivation. Our own we no one can walk the path for us. We have to motivate ourselves to do that. And we do have interesting a, a part of our um aura. Uh, it's interesting, you know. My my father was a psychiatrist, very successful, and he uh, you know mental emotional things were common you know dinner table conversation and then here you're studying the aura and you're understanding in the aura now energetically thoughts and emotions are completely different they're in completely different places in the aura your mind center is literally right in there's a chakra in here and that is literally radiating your thought energies right now your emotional energies are radiating in a chakra point down by your navel there are two different parts of you. So we like to say emotions don't think. I have to say that that's not my experience of teaching this for 45 years. Yeah. Well, that I, that I would, I think you're talking about the, the brain center and you're also talking about the solar plexus. Is that right? Because we haven't mentioned the heart thus far. Well, the course, heart we're, is different. The heart we're, is lear we're learning that the heart actually has an energy field which is 5,000 times greater than the brain. Well, I'm not speaking of the brain right now. And what in our in our teachings, but if we speak brain, of mind, we're talking about the totality of our cellular no, consciousness, aren't we? We no, can't just locate it. No, we can. Uh, again, I'm just have sharing you how we how we teach. That the, the thing I've always loved about the aura is things that are conceptual actually have a an energetic location. So in our teaching there is a mental chakra point within the, the head, the physical head, that is actually the thinker. And the brain is the instrument for that, for that thinking. So as ideas can come in from the divine source beyond the mental chakra point, it's actually the mental chakra point that's taking those ideas, processing them. Gosh, I'm talking about our next book now, The Secret of Consciousness. Um, and then it registers in the brain. And like a piano and a pianist, you're not actually hearing the music till the, the note is struck on the key and the piano radiates the sound. It's the same way here. The mind can be generating something, but until it strikes the brain, we're not going to pick it up as a thought. But in our teaching, emotions, because they're in the, the this point, chakra point by the navel, they are the end. You asked us, you asked me what, what motivates you. So saying that emotions are the engine of action. So once you engage a thought with an emotion, you're going to do something about it. You're, you're, you're going to move it into motion. You, you have fired the gunpowder. 
in our change of book, we say a thought is like a bullet. It's going to sit in the chamber of the gun until gunpowder pushes it out. Emotions are the gunpowder. So the more you get emotionally engaged in something, including your spiritual journey, that's when you're really going to do something about it. Now, again, just sharing your thing. The other thing you just said that was so important, again, just sharing our teachings, the heart chakra, which we call the hermetic center, why that's so crucial, why there is so much power there that you're describing is it's actually the seat of the soul. When the soul actually incarnates, again, the soul's not physical, as we know. Um, our body's like a car, you know, we, we drive it around, our soul drives it around. It's here. Now, in our, in our teaching, the hermetic center, the heart chakra, is your action center. It's your interaction with, with life here in the physical world. So what we teach is you learn, your soul grows through experience. You can think a wonderful thought, but until you move that into, you know, until it registers in the heart, until it becomes a part of you through your experience, it's not really wisdom. As we would say, truth is not truth until it does live in your heart. Mm -hmm. And so you, that's why the, the ancients also say in patience, you possess your soul because it takes time to go through experience. I can say right now, it'll take me not even a second. Oh, I need to be more patient. That's one of my character weaknesses. I need to I need to learn to let things happen in God's time. I tend to push sometimes. But they didn't take me 10 seconds to say that. It could literally take me 20 years to develop that skill. But it's 20 years well spent because once you learn it here, you take it to eternity. If it stays in the, in the head, it's just information. So we also caution in our in our courses Look, as metaphysicians, you're learning many things about the mystical life. Don't confuse that with wisdom. It's not yet wisdom until you take all those things you're learning and literally put it into action with your soul and all parts of you. And then it then it becomes wisdom. Then it, then it becomes eternal and you will take it to the other side, this side, wherever you're at, you will have that glorious knowledge with you. And that's what we're all learning. Mm -hmm. So wisdom is embodiment, isn't it? It's when exactly. the experience exactly. Exactly. is um, of acute value so that thought and feeling become entwined as one. Yeah. And then we yeah. begin to realize that feeling is the language of the soul so that we can begin to see the great metaphors of life. I mean, we see this in 3D at the moment, don't we? Because so much of the central organizing chaos that exists is to do with the fact that there is, as Abraham Lincoln would say, wrong thinking rather than right thinking, Good. wrong doing Good. rather than right doing, because of, the di because of the great divorce between thought and feeling. The cerebrum has become overly energized. Uh, amazing. So, w where do where would you like to be um, as you move through the next thirty years to the point of transition? <laughs> well, man proposes, God disposes, right? I think the next the next cycle of my life is more more teaching, more giving, building up a bigger, shall we say, following, not just for its own sake, but we know there are many more people that are ready who haven't found this yet and taking all these skills and knowledge and talent and wisdom that I have developed or whatever degree I've developed it and take it further. Uh, you know, it's never going to end. I'm, I'm going to be working on this to the day, you know, my last day on earth, you know, old soldiers never die. They just fade away. Right. <laughs> you know, it, well, it's, it's just, it's, it's a reflection of the fact that we're part of an infinitely unfolding creative possibility. Exactly. Exactly. This right. Is the wonderful evolution that we're beginning to realize that we have the potential of infinite, um, of infinite awareness, so that we actually really do see ourselves as the way that we are, as reflections of the divine. We are beacons of light, that the divine has given the opportunity to be here on planet Earth and to take part in this cosmic experiment through the, the, the profound difficulties, as we were saying earlier, of weight, space and time and duality, which confuses everybody. Everybody gets caught up in the neuroses of separation rather than seeing the glory of diversity. So when when you go deep into the nature of 
the crystalline presence of your spiritual evolution and the way that you describe it in the book, what, what do you feel is the absolute core of your teaching? Where does the teaching rest as being a p position of pure thriving? Um, you mean, where did the where did all this come from? Or what would you say is the core teaching? Well, that, that's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah, where did this all come from? Yeah. I love it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking, you know, I, because you have a way of being able to engage in the gymnastic of thought to, to discern and discern like that, the and describe <laughs> the way that you perceive all of these immensely subtle vibrations right. and frequencies, you know. Um, I, was, I was writing something this afternoon after deep meditation, and um, Archangel Michael, who's been with me for the seven, nearly 70 years of my life, um, ancient souls do not need the human data language. We use the poetry of frequency, tone, and vibration. Weave that into something you're writing, I heard. <laughs> So really what I'm talking about is, um, you know, we've, we've, we've seen the spiritual evolution as being something that is rich and full of longevity. The older we get, the more we realize why we're living these years as human beings, because it takes time to address fully um, be fully conscious of and to embody the wisdom of the training process right. it takes time to achieve these things right 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 which makes so much more sense so you know what would you say to your 27 year old self well okay be patient yeah yeah well had i known at 25 when i had how long i be i might have had a little different perspective because sometimes when you start the journey you're so excited with the journey, you're really not looking that far ahead. At least I was in, in my case. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, uh, forgive me for going to the Bible, but they say, seek God early. If you've had your awakening early in life, that is, you are so fortunate. Because, first of all, you're still planting the seeds of your life, you know, what you're going to do with it. And, if, and then if this can be woven into it, we do have some students that have been, you know, very successful in their careers and families and they had their awakening later right and it, it caused a little bit of a you know it didn't quite jive with the world that they were in and it was there was definitely an adjustment to make so i know when you're in your 20s you know a lot of people around you are not thinking about this stuff <laughs> they're they're you know they're pursuing other things and you're thinking about whether you're gonna have family and romance and all these things and careers but yeah do it now. I we have noticed more and more younger people are joining the classes now and just have had their awakening. And I think I really generally think you know when I really came of age, the quote unquote new age stuff was there. What I what I like to call all the you know it's kind of not the circus floor, but a lot of the psychic stuff was very popular back then. And now that that time is gone, you know that that era is really truly ended. But what has seemed to be emerging now is maybe not so clearly defined as that, at least now, but a maturity. People are wanting, I mean, I have to be, you know, if we had wrote this book 20 years ago on evolution, it would not nearly have stuck. In those days, they wanted to hear about the aura. They wanted to hear about the angels. Now they want to hear more about growth. And I think that's a wonderful, it's a maturity. I think the whole movement has matured and i i have to thank younger generations because i think they're asking for it i think they're wanting it maybe they're feeling more the pressures of life or whatever is going on how can they make sense of what's happening in the world today i'm not sure the reason but I, i'm glad you asked that because yes we've just seen there's more people wanting this even at a younger age than i remember it used to be really just people sort of our own age, you know, but really now it's truly cross-generational. And it's very exciting to see that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel that maybe it's a moment to um, positively dwell on the nature of our young ones and how they're coming through with a more awakened consciousness about their spirituality, oh. 
uh, which is really a journey back to wholeness, isn't it? About yes. their soul yep. and all of the attributions thereof, you know, where they're from, the kinship that they feel as star seeds. So we begin to see these great waves. I was part of the indigo wave, which I guess you were as well, and that we're here to really upset the patriarchy and bring about great change. Um, and then, of course, we know we moved into the crystal children and then into the rainbow children, et cetera, et cetera. And I have a number who I'm looking after at the moment. I've always worked with young people. And when I say oh, that, I'm 17, 18, 19 year olds, principally because I was for 40 years um, training young actors. And oh, so, we're, right. you know, working in that context. But of course, you know, acting is actually about becoming a chiaroscura. It's about becoming a shaman. It's about becoming um, the athlete of the soul because right at the very core of great acting is a truth of feeling statement. So, of course, it's about accessing the fullness of one being rather than just learning the lines and going onto a stage or in front of a camera and camping around. It's not about that. That's all about ego. It's about going much, much, much deeper. Right. At least, right. you know, in, in the tradition that I arise out of, the lineage that I arise out of. So they are, you know, the, the young people today are really remarkable. They are so beautiful in their love and in their tenderness and within their vulnerability. And they've helped us give birth to the whole understanding of the empathic and this revolution of the empaths that is moving through. Of course, we know that these, this level of teaching has been around for centuries and centuries and centuries. And um, although... Um, um, the, you know, it will remain not a secret, but a, a gentle mystery where Dimitri actually is. I know where he is, and he's in the most extraordinary place on the western coastline where a great teacher uh, found a beautiful um, shrine and ashram. Right. Do you feel that you're part of the teachings that have evolved through your witness of Barbara and also your own development, are they connected with any of the great spiritual lineages? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. No, um, you know, all great teachings have a lineage and have a tradition. They don't just sort of pop in of themselves. And um, actually ours, well, you're getting into another giant subject here right now. <laughs> um, we, we say this is a 4,000 year tradition that basically began with the ancient Hebrew mystics. We, our terminology for it is the kingdom of light teachings. Barba's teacher and mentor called it Christos wisdom, meaning the anointed wisdom, you know, and it's followed through different, obviously incarnations, but it's been a steady lineage from then till now. And it does seem to be, again, this is an era of even more awakening with this. So yes, we, we, we wouldn't be here without that foundation. And um, this is, this is true, you know, with all the great traditions, they, you know, B Madame Blavatsky tried to show, you know, regardless the face of what it is, it's, it's coming, you know, from the same kind of stream. I mean, it may be a different face and, dealing with a culture at a time, you know, we got to remember that the different traditions didn't talk to each other that much till fairly recently, you know, so it may appear like things are very different and on surface, maybe they are, but if you go back to the roots, they're really much more in common. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, I think we're getting now to see how we're more alike than how we're different. I love the study of comparative religions and spiritual traditions because you're finding more and more commonality there and that we're all trying to go to the same, you know, we're, we're trying to do the same thing, maybe in a different way, but the same thing. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I started very young with the Indian traditions. I was called when the students oh, ready. Yeah. Um, um, and what I became so aware of about this extraordinary planet on which we live, which is increasingly smaller than it was then because of the global village, right. is that you know, one of the great teachings I received was that wherever we go, human nature stays the same. Human mm -hmm. beings may change somewhat because of cultural expectation, because of linguistic, because of all of these wonderful forces of uh, how we live our physiology in culture, that they have an effect. But actually, human nature is the same wherever we go. Yeah. That's what's fun about teaching all of the people that we teach, isn't it? Because yeah. right at the very core of it is love. That's and so... Totally. 
Absolutely. really dealing with the absence of love. So I asked the question because I was intrigued, A, you know, from a point of view of my own curiosity, but also because earlier you mentioned the master's name. You were speaking of the hermetic principle of the heart. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you could possibly share with us what that means to you. And if I may, while Dimitri is doing this, Dimitri, is it okay if I ask everybody if they have questions for you? Yes, please. You please. Questions, just please. write them in the chat box, everybody, while um, Dimitri is giving us the, the wonder of the wisdom that he's gathered around, around the whole substance of the hermetic principles. Um, wow, it's funny. We just talked about this in class last week, so you're tuning right in there. Um, well, this yeah. is my master, you see, who's yeah. been with me yeah. for yeah. 50 years. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have the heart chakra, as we commonly call it. Uh, but in our tradition, we do call it the Hermetic Center. And exactly as Stuart is saying, it's honoring Hermes Trismegistus, Hermes the Thrice Greatest. Now, People, the, the hermetic tradition is a little bit, you know, for something that's so profoundly important, I, I find it, gosh, uh, how come it's not even more known, you know, than it really is, or at least commonly is right now. Barbara's first teaching when she was 11 year old came from a hermetic scientist who could see the aura like she could. And Hermes, you could say he laid down the whole metaphysical world. I mean, without that great celestial being, um, we wouldn't have what we have here now. Um, now, it's common to think, oh, is Hermes really a Egyptian? You know, because there's a lot of association with that. And Egypt was a time where one of the great emissaries of Hermes came through. But Hermes himself is kind of for the world, right? And, and many work with him. Now, the reason we honor him in the Hermetic Center is from our understanding and teaching at this time, since Hermes is with the term Lord of the world, he's extremely involved with the realization of the divine plan. So if the Hermetic Center is, is dealing with activity of life, and we all have this, and we're all part of a great plan, well, that plan has to be orchestrated. And, and Hermes is playing an enormous role in that. Um, so yes, that's kind of where we're, how we're honoring that. And I'm, I appreciate you, you know, bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's part of the, um, consanguinity from a spiritual point between you and I and uh, Bar Barbara and I, you know, that we, we share the principles of the hermetic line, yeah. uh, my the whole of my life is suspended biographically around the teachings of the master, as I refer to him, um, whom who originally I knew as Thoth, and now I know as Saint Germain. Um, one or two people are asking some really interesting questions. Um, Nima Taro, wow, what a name! Uh, why use such an old system like chakras? Uh, um, an old system uh, that sounds slightly pejorative. Does it really make sense to segregate the body and the spirit anymore? I think you've misunderstood what we were talking about, but maybe, Dimitri, could you speak to that? Did you see that question? Yeah, I do see it. Um, well, I don't, again, we have to be a little careful how we study something as opposed to what things actually are. So the chakra system is an old study, but it's not outdated. You have chakras. We all have, it, it's part of us this very moment. Now, how we've come to understand the chakras through the centuries has varied. And it was an extremely secret teaching, even in India, by the way, for a long time. Um, now it's becoming more known as part of this global awakening. So um, I don't know how to exactly answer the first part of that question, other than to say, we all have them today. And one of the things we do try to emphasize in our teachings is a more modern understanding of that system in language that's appropriate to today as opposed to maybe a thousand years ago. Um, now, the second question you're asking, does it really make sense to segregate body and spirit? Well, they are distinctly different parts of you. You don't confuse your hand with your foot. So even though it's part of the body. So you are a spirit inhabiting a body. You, Your body, this us we are going to shed it one day but you're not going to shed your spirit 
So while they work and in, intertwined, they really are distinctly different things. And the important thing here is, again, I'm getting we're getting so many interesting subjects here is when the when the focus, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but when the focus is too much on the body, we start to think materialistically that we are just this congregation of cells and atoms, and that's all there is, you know. And the whole point of metaphysical study is to, of course, recognize that part of us, but recognize within all that cell structure and atoms and all of that is this living presence, is this living eternal spirit that is not, as Stuart's been saying, subject to time and duration. Because when something's eternal, it's never had a beginning and it will never have an end. But that which had a beginning, like our physical birth, will have an end. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. One of the ways that, uh, if I may add, a gentle degree, um, one of the ways that I've always taught chakra, because I teach them through sound as well as light, because sound and light for me are one. Um, when as a child I was synesthetic, I still am today, it's just that I've expanded my consciousness. So I saw sound as light and mm -hmm. had difficulty being in 3D as a result, because it was infinitely greater to experience that than, than to come into 3D. And so I had problems with writing, however, uh, with reading rather. Um, uh, chakras, uh, I've always seen them as the biocomputers for our energy. They're the databases for the whole of our energy, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. So if we think, see them in those terms, then that's really cool because they become the biocomputers of our whole experience. Um, and also Marjorie was asking about the, do you see that there is a connection between the hermetic principles and Kundalini awakening? Because we're mixing traditions, which is fascinating. Yes, yes. Well, thank you, Marjorie, for that question. Well, the way to think of it is the, the hermetic teachings is like a whole umbrella of teachings. It's not one avenue. It, it encompasses all of it. So the study of Kundalini is part of the hermetic teachings. So Kundalini, we have to recognize again, is an energetic force in every single person on this planet. So it's where we're at in the expression of it may vary, but we, we all have the same basic aura composition. We don't all have the same aura. We don't all have it developed to the same way, but it's all there. So what we would say is, again, hermetic the, the genuine hermetic teachings would, would definitely include the study of what the Kundalini is, how it's part of your life, and you know how you manage it. I will say one just note of caution there having worked with Barbara and helping people, you don't, I would caution anyone from directly trying to develop their Kundalini. It is an energy that does develop in its own time. And we have counseled people that were literally on the verge of insanity because they played with fire and they couldn't handle it. And it was a really, really difficult chore trying to help get that equilibrium. So I learned early on to truly respect that power. <laughs> you know, it is not, again, you literally are playing with fire there. And it is, as you're doing all the other wonderful things that you're doing, it is naturally evolving. And if you have a Kundalini experience, that's wonderful. But again, just see it as part of the overall picture of your evolution. You know, Sri Aurobindo said an interesting thing where sometimes people get caught on the intervening planes. They have experiences of things and they think they've reached the pinnacle, you know, but really they're here as opposed to here. So what we've always taught is when you have wonderful experiences, kind of see that as God knocking on your shoulder or tapping your shoulder saying, good work, you know, keep, keep moving up, but don't settle there. Keep as, as we're all saying here today, it's, it's a, it's a journey that keeps going. So we all want to think, okay, this was a beautiful experience, but it's part of an experience that even something more beautiful that's coming up. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful, absolutely. And of course, in all of these processes, I, I think you can probably hear from Dimitri, and I will certainly second, that I feel that anybody who is really earnest and in love with the devotional pathway really must have a teacher just as we're seeing yeah. even in you know i work ex work extensively in the corporate world up until the beginning of um, covid 
that even there, there is this wonderful suggestion that um, the great, the great uh, business makers now have coaches. They have mentors. <laughs> it's, it's the same thing, which is wonderful. Joyful Jennifer brings up a really interesting point. Why is it that it's such a secret or a mystery to uncover truth? A game that I don't like. We well, don't like games, but you're Joyful Jennifer. I would love you to know that I love games. <laughs> it's such fun. But you yeah. make a really interesting point, which is we've we you know we are of a certain age, Dimitri, and here we are talking about the uncovering, the unveiling that is taking yeah. place at this time, and that when we came into the levels of consciousness that we came into, much of the mysteries were being hid. C could you perhaps speak yes. to yes. please? Well, do remember this when the when the student is ready, the teacher appears. When you are ready to receive a truth, truth is never sealed to anyone who is ready to receive it. The question is the teachings and the training part, because Stuart said you really need a teacher at some point. So the mystery teachings were, you know, the ancient Greeks had the mystery schools, the Eleusinian mysteries thrive for 1500 years and they were so successful people still don't know what went on in there right as far as anything written in evidence because of the sacredness of what they were doing hmm. so when you are stepping remember in the end the mystery of life is something to experience right we're sharing these wonderful ideas but in the end each of you have already had or will be having experiences that can not be put in words they're they're beyond words so they do have to be the 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 the, uh, the sacredness of this does have to be protected so that when it truly is your time and you're ready to receive it you will receive it with its full bounty you know the bible says you know nothing you know that which isn't shall be revealed in the end it's all revealed now the whole idea of truth, boy, are we living in an age where we get a lot of got to learn that lesson right now? <laughs> Everybody says, I got the truth. I got the truth. I got the truth. And, you know, with the Internet, whether they say, you know, uh, uh, non, you know, falsehoods travel six times faster than than the truth because we get caught up in the sensational part of things. So absolutely. The fact that maybe some inner mystical understanding is not fully revealed yet doesn't mean you do not find truth and search for the things that are important for you. I'm still learning things. I would hardly say I know it all, not even close. The more you learn, the more you actually realize how much more there is to learn. And there's a very interesting practice, Dimitri, isn't there, that we know of from the mystery schools thousands of years ago, that when there was an awareness of the projected evolution of human consciousness, that the holy mysteries were placed beyond the veil, what was known as sub rosa, I literally beneath the rose. And of course, the rose has always been an extraordinary emblem for the Divine Mother. So they were all under the protection of the Divine Mother of Mary, or indeed of Isis or Magdalene or Kuan Yin. And now everything is being awakened because our consciousness has developed to a certain extent where hopefully, as Dimitri was just saying, we have the discernment to see what is true and what is false. Yeah. And in order to achieve that level of discernment as a parting, as a parting oracle, dear Dimitri, how do we discern what is true and what is false? Oh my goodness. Wow. I don't know if I can say it in two minutes, but <laughs> other than to say there is objective truth, it's not your truth and my truth. We, you want to seek the universal truth, the, the laws of life. You know, one thing I've learned in the aura, if there is a negative energy in there, it doesn't matter what you think is right or wrong. If it's, an, if it's an unhealthy energy, you've just got to expunge it. So ask your own higher nature, ask your, the own divine part of you, yeah. To reveal yeah. the truth, and I don't want to. I don't want the rose-colored glasses. I don't want to do. I don't want. I don't want to be my ego stroked. I want the truth, even if it at a moment it's not always the easiest thing to hear. In the end, truth will set you free. It will be the best thing for you. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And of course, when we're when we're really grounded, as we often were as children, we all knew our own truth barometer. We all knew 
what situations were pure and what were impure. We all knew who, which of the adults was pure and who was impure. Do you remember? So I feel that we just simply need to really regress and open the inner child and bring the inner child into the wonderment of where we are now. This has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you will agree. And thank you so much for all of these interesting questions. Um, and for the, you know, on your behalf, I, I thank uh, Dimitri. Um, Dimitri, of course, has this wonderful website. And as you've heard, it really, he, hold, he and Barbara hold this ancient mystery school, which is called the Spiritual Arts. And so here is the website. And um, many of you know who I am. So please don't hesitate to go to stuartpierce.com. And a personal bit, you know, two people today have had to withdraw from an amazing retreat that I'm holding in December in sacred Egypt. Ooh. So if anybody's interested, go to the website and you'll see it on the events page. It's called the Resurrection Retreat. Dimitri, this has been wonderful. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. It's been an honor being here. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. And so I say to all of you, namaste, namaste, namaste. Be safe. Be healthy and laugh a lot. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs>